All right, guys, it's Lauren Lando for another installment of the interview uh, through Elite Sports Services. Uh, today, I'm very, very fortunate to be with Rob Taylor. Uh, Rob Taylor has been in the strength and conditioning field for a long, long time. And I don't say that because he's old, because he has been, he's been hands, all hands on deck, and he is in the trenches and has done that for quite some time. He also has a, a, a fantastic podcast. If you ever get a chance to listen to it, it's on on sttpodcast.com. I suggest that you listen to it. I was fortunate enough, I think about three, four years ago, Rob, you graciously had me on, and, and I thank you and, uh, so much. I still get comments to this day about the interview that you and I did, so thank you so much. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's really been a cool uh, project to start, and it, it honestly started way back when I was in college, and I make it a really big point to spend one hour a week reaching out to other professionals in our field and just asking them simple questions. What has worked for you, and what do you know now that you wish you knew then? Hmm. And uh, the way it started was uh, very simple. One of the staff members said, hey, why don't we start recording this instead of listening to my you know, uh, Cliff Notes version of it at, in the staff meeting? And I didn't believe you could do it back in the day. I mean, when you and I started, we couldn't do these types of interactions across the country. And uh, long story short, again, a couple years go by, and these – uh, interns come in again and they said, hey, why don't we put this on iTunes or, or iHeartRadio or one of the other platforms so we can listen to it in my car. And I'm like, there's no way you can do that. And now to see what you know, you and, and a bunch of other people in the field, I think it's such an incredible way uh, to really connect with others and, and just learn what has worked for others. Well, I, right, and I think to your point too, I think that we find so many commonalities of struggles and issues that we've all had in the field. But I think a lot of times people always held it close to their car, their, hold their cards close to their chest, and never really talked about it. And in these types of platforms, people come out and they're pretty, they're pretty candid about, hey, here's here's been my failures along the the way. So um, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you really kind of. You know, laying the groundwork for a lot of us who have kind of seen what you're doing and building off of it. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I think we have over 700 uh, episodes in house. Uh, there's uh, over 700 interviews that I have recorded. I think we have over. Th I think we have just about 300 now on the show uh, that are probably let's call them the best of the best. Some of them are not appropriate for, <laughs> for obviously the G-rated show that we produce. Um, but again, it, it's nice to be able to just to reach out to them. And and another big thing is the networking of it. Uh, again, and I'm not just saying with this because you and I are on a show today, but whatever show you do from here on out, uh, it's very important for the listeners or yourself to encourage people to, to not only just listen but to then send an email or, as you and I implied before the show even started, a, a, a tweet or a Facebook post or something just to say, hey, thanks for spending some time just sharing what has worked for you. Uh, and and that, that networking goes a long way when you and I are speaking at different events or get a chance to run into other people and, and uh, you really get a chance to see what, the, what type of impact this type of environment makes. Oh, you're absolutely right. So, well, here, you know, here's what I'd like to do is find out a little about, a little bit about you, and, and what got you into the world that you are in now. I always tell my young coaches when they come in, what you think you're going to do long term, definitely doesn't look like it usually at the beginning of your career. So maybe you can rewind for us a little bit about what got Rob Taylor started in this industry. Yeah, I actually don't know any other type of job. I've been an athletic-minded individual since I've been young. Uh, I was very fortunate to have a, a very driven and, and uh, disciplined father and, and parents, and uh, they told me to go to landscaping when I was early in that, uh, that high school, college days, and I said, this is not what I want to do. So I made sure that I studied very hard in high school and into college. Uh, I was very lucky to play athletics and sports in college and then get a chance to live in, and do things in the pros. Um, but I, I, then I spent time in college. I mean, trying to keep you a, a Cliff Notes version. Um, when I was in college, I, I just found out that, uh, you know, maybe it wasn't what I really wanted to do as far as the, uh, the commitment from others. A lot of times you are, you are a, a little bit of a servant uh, to the coaches you work with, the, the administration. Uh, sometimes you're limited by budget and some other things there that uh, I just don't know if I got to a point where I was either you know, tired of that or just wanted to be able to control my own destiny kind of thing. And uh, I, I spent uh, almost 10 years, you know, probably more than that, probably a dozen years in the, in the college sector. Uh, I was a two-time college strength and conditioning coach of the year finalist with the NSCA. Uh, I had an opportunity in the pros to work with athletes that went on and won uh, Super Bowls and World Series. And, and um, some of them are in the Hall of Fame at the moment. I mean, um, to, to see the type of people that we get a chance to work with and see their commitment to excellence uh, was incredible. And then I got a chance to just do stuff throughout the course of the year when I was in college, when it was non-recruiting time or doing camps and that type of stuff. And you see there's a big void in the public sector. And, and everybody that starts in, in our field wants to work with pros. And it, it's 
it's kind of a weird way that we set this up. Your expectation is way above where you probably need to be or need to start. Um, and so it just turns out to a situation where I said, why don't we take this show to the to the private sector and see what we can do? And I was very fortunate to hook up with a bunch of coaches that uh, have been extremely supportive of what I do uh, from a basketball sense. And now we've morphed into uh, um, uh, very high-end uh, swim clubs and, and some other teams in the area, uh, military and that type of thing. And, and just uh, – this entire concept of what we were doing in the college sector has really uh, just blown up for us and, and really helped us uh, uh, help others achieve greatness. Well, that's awesome. And I, I, I like the fact that you spent so much time in the college sector because you could sit there and, and really kind of immerse yourself in it, spend 10 to 12 years in that and really learn the craft and really sit there and say, okay, you know, there's a lot of things out of my control here. And, you know, I'm looking for something different and going into that private sector um, is always a na nice way to kind of control your own destiny. Yeah. I think everybody always wants to come out of school as that college strength coach, but it's good to know that there's other options out there. And I think a lot of times, uh, particularly when you and I started, it wasn't an option. I mean, there were there was really nobody doing it. Now it's like a Starbucks where you have somebody on every corner doing performance enhancement or strength and conditioning in the private sector. So I'm sure you've seen that evolve quite a bit. Now, is there is there a lot of that in your area currently? Yeah, in Baltimore, we have a very high density of personal trainers, uh, boot camps. I mean, there's many there's there's a lot of options for people that want to pursue physical fitness uh, to pursue. Uh, I predominantly work with uh, the majority of our, our, our clients are going to be athletic minded and I say that because they may or not play a sport on Saturday uh, but they have that persona to them. They, they could be a CEO of companies um, and, and they just want to be treated as a, an athlete. Absolutely. They're going to be held accountable to the time they're supposed to work out. Uh, they're going to be asked about their nutrition and their sleep and their hydration uh, and how they're removing stress from their lives and, and uh, what their relationships are like at home and, and those types of things because a lot of that plays a bigger role than our magic programming that a lot of people get emotionally attached to. Uh, when you start really finding out about the relationships uh, that are going on between you and the other clients that you get a chance to work with, and the people that they get a chance to touch as well, that's when I think you really start to see success starts to breed from the inside out. You know, it's funny you say that. I just did a podcast yesterday with uh, Mike Dolce, and he asked me in there. He said, well, so you just work with athletes? I said, well, I said, well, one thing you need to understand about me is I do have some general populations, but I view everybody as an athlete. My business executives, everybody like that who I see early in the morning, they're, they're like-minded. They want to, they're like-minded like that athlete. They want to have someone that they're accountable to get their day started right, but, but they have goals uh, that they're trying to achieve, and they're trying to lead their staff. And so it's funny that you made that point, like everybody's an athlete, and you know maybe the goals have changed a little bit differently, or maybe the goals have changed and the abilities have changed, but at the end of the day, it's the mindset that we're creating. That's cool. Um, now talk to me a little bit. Let's go back to the uh, collegiate sector. And talk to me a little bit about some of the pros and cons that you felt dealing with that. Obviously, you probably love the team camaraderie and the, the, the you know, all, all this entire staff and this entire team, you know, looking at going after one goal. Talk to me about some of the positives and negatives that you found being in the collegiate sector. Well, uh, I'll start with the negatives because I want to finish with positives because that's what most of the time people will remember. So let's start there. I think when people, as, as a young professional in this field, uh, please realize that this is not a nine-to-five gig. Uh, this is a a full day of work is probably about 20 hours. Uh, when someone says you know, you know we only did a half day of work today, that that's a 12 hour commitment. Uh, you are going to put in Saturdays, Sundays, holidays. Uh, you are you're probably going to miss a kid's first basketball practice. You're gonna, probably going to miss a parent's uh, birthday. Um, it, it, there's just sacrifices you have to make in this field uh, if you want to participate in, in this industry at that level. And you have to agree to that way in advance. It's very difficult to walk up to a coach and say, hey, I'm going to miss game day or, or the conditioning test because um, i got to take the dog to the vet. It just doesn't work. It, it, it just doesn't work. you got to have a, an unbelievable support system from your family to your, your husband, your wife, your friends. Uh, and I think that's really where you, you separate yourself as far as the, the professionals in our field that have been doing this for a long time. They've been, been, they've been able to uh, – Really develop a support system around them that's very, very advantageous. Uh, I think the other, the other thing there, you got to have a big commitment from the administration uh, to support the amount of uh, of stresses that we go through as strength conditioning coaches. That it's often overlooked because relative, even though strength and conditioning has been in uh, the college sector for a while, being done at a high level or being done well, I don't know if it's if it's there yet from top to bottom from the elite 
uh, Division One institutions all the way down to D3, there's a huge drop-off in what we are capable of uh, from staffing commitments, from a financial commitment, from a personnel, uh, as far as administration supporting the strength and conditioning staff, et cetera. Um, how do you connect with a sports psychologist? How do you connect with the sports medicine team, the sports nutritionist? Uh, now we're getting people that can even monitor the sleep habits. Uh, I mean, those are all really important things that not every institution has access to. So a lot of times the strength coach has that thrusted upon them. And if you're not well-versed in that and you're not comfortable going out and finding out and, and getting help uh, outside of your own skill set, uh, I think that can be real negative for that, that, uh, that person in particular. Um, as far as the positives, you, you implied it very uh, wholeheartedly, man. Everybody sees game day. They see the fireworks going off. They see the smoke in the tunnel. Uh, they see the guys putting the mouthpieces in and jumping and hooting and hollering. Um, that part is, uh, is priceless. And every, th every sacrifice you go through, um, that's worth it. That makes it worth it, to be very honest. Those, those moments, those seconds uh, become very, very powerful. Uh, they become almost uh, euphoric or, or they almost become like a drug. Hmm. And everything else you go through, whether it's in July at 120 degree heat with 80 percent humidity and uh, you got to get your sprints in or go out early or stay late, uh, it's all worth it for that one moment where the guy blows a whistle and we all can go out and compete. Um, if you're a, if you're a competitive person, man, that is what you want to live and do and, and breathe in that environment uh, for sure. Um, the, the other parts, obviously, that's an easy one. But the, the building the relationships is really cool. I mean, I get a chance to uh, we don't we have a lot of athletes. We had 430 plus athletes that I had an opportunity to work with on a daily basis, and I saw some of them for rehab or strength and conditioning stuff, or uh, just coming down talking about uh, adult advice or just a sounding board. Uh, that, that no one else saw. Um, the coaches didn't see it. The administration didn't see it. The emails uh, through the night or the text messages nowadays that we can do that that interaction. Uh, all of those things become an unbelievable uh, resource. And, and be able to look back on that and say uh, that you made a positive impact on the lives of others uh, is probably worth more than any other accolade that I could have ever achieved, whether it's a championship or a coach of the year titles or whatever. But um, to be able to go downtown in, in Baltimore now and, and see the, the grown men and grown ladies and, and we'll be out to eat and they throw a, you know, send us a drink or they'll pick up the check. Uh, I think that really says a lot about who you were as a coach and, and the amount of uh, the commitment that they felt as far as the passion you shared with them. Absolutely, and and you know what? You gave us so much great information there. One on on the the reality side, the negative side of of, of some constraints, but really, I think you touched on why we all get into this field. It's those moments that you talked about that you can't describe to anybody else who's not in the field. It's very hard for them to understand what you're talking about um, because those are what light you up with goosebumps. And, and I say it all the time, is like that taste of success, that's the drug, that's the addiction that as coaches, we, we, we once you get it, you just want more of it. And it's, it, it's what keeps us fighting and it keeps us, you know, up late, uh, or, or staying up late programming, getting up early uh, to get our sessions in. So uh, thank you so much for sharing all that because I, I can tell your passion uh, just as you were going on on that whole topic. That was awesome. I'll give your listeners uh, three things here that are that are not discussed by any major certification. Uh, if you go to a psychology convention, whatever, they're, they're not listening. To, they're not, they're not going to get this. Uh, when someone comes in our facility, there's three things that we teach in-house, and you can use this, Lauren, tomorrow in your, in your programming. I want you to ask, give, and touch. When someone walks in the, in the facility, I want you to ask more questions and then listen to more, re, more responses. That develops a relationship when, you, when you're showing a passion uh, to, to inquire about someone else's day or their health or those types of things. I want you to give them something so we can give them a towel or, or give them some of our emotion or some of our, our passion. Uh, so generally our towel is our symbol kind of thing of, of, of welcome to here. Whatever happened outside the doors is no longer important. Right now it's about you. And then the other thing is touch. I'm a high fives guy. Our, our staff, if they want to they wanna raise – uh, they got to increase their, their high fives during, during the day or through the week um, by 10%. And I actually track that. I mean, people have record boards awesome. where they have uh, a bench press record board or uh, the squat record board. or you, you, you mean clean or jerk, whatever else. That you get the gist. I'm just not into that. I, I really think that championship people, championship teams, they touch and they interact and they do it in a very positive way. And if we can encourage that type of connection uh, through the physical contact of others, uh, your business, your teams, uh, the people you connect with will all be more successful. 
Absolutely. Those are great points. And I think it leads back to what you said earlier. It's the relationship component of it. And I think in this industry, for all those listening, you can work in the private sector. But if you if you just get results, but you don't have relationships, your, your clientele is going to diminish. If you're good at relationships, but not at producing the results, same thing. If you can produce results and relationships, you win. You win. And, and the only way I think that you can really get people to buy into your system of training or whatever it is you're, you're, you're giving them is through the relationship process. I love it. How many coaches do you have working for you? Uh, we have uh, right now we have three full time staff members and then we have 21 interns and that fluctuates uh, anywhere between 12 and sometimes more than 25 uh, interns. Uh, and they could be grad students. They could all be, they could be internationals. They could be uh, local kids, uh, again, depending on the time of the year. Uh, we actually have a very structured um, uh, experience here that involves a very comprehensive standpoint from uh, marketing to social media to radio shows like this one, uh, editing um, events because we do education all over the place, uh, all the way down to training. And that could be training with um, an 11 or 12 year old young lady who is unbelievable at basketball. And it could also go all the way to our pros and, and Olympians, uh, our Paralympians, um, or even our general population. Uh, we really don't treat you any differently. Uh, Regardless of who you, who you are or where you are, uh, we just try to give you as much passion as we can share with you on that given day. Awesome. So 12 to 21 interns uh, and sometimes upward of 25, that is amazing. Yeah. Uh, and it sounds like they're getting a, a holistic approach to performance training in the industry itself. Do you find that um, it's tough to manage or – if, if I'm an intern, how? What's the intake like? It do I am I flying the wall for the first week or two, or am, are my hands getting dirty right away? Uh, explain yeah. to us a little bit about your internship process. Yeah, I'm not a slow mo guy. Uh, I'm a I'm I a pretty tell. Uh, I'm a pretty intense dude. And the way it kind of works is it's a, a little bit of a chain of command. So the people who or were interns, the the session before you, or let's say the the um, they're no longer privates in our team kind of scenario. They're no longer rookies because everything's based in, in that sport model for us. So they're no longer rookies. So sophomores teach freshmen and, and so on. And we normally start with one exercise. So on day one, uh, we actually do a two-week volunteer experience. So um, you have basically two weeks to commit if you, to, to finding out if, if you're part of our team or, or even if you fit into what we're doing. Uh, my expectation is is very high from the concept of the energy giver standpoint. Oh, I love if you it. Can't, if you can't fit that mantra, then I'm gonna I'm gonna refer you to other people to do the your, do your experience because you won't like what I'm about to put you through for the next 12, 15 weeks because it'll be outside your comfort zone. Uh, there might be another profession uh, like wood carving that you might want to go into or, or uh, mechanic or whatever. But in our field, you have to be an energy giver. You have to bring that level of commitment up uh, from others, and you got to do that through the passion you share on a daily basis. Uh, so on day one, we normally start them as simply as it sounds on a three-way row, uh, teaching lift, hold, and lower. And they'll probably do that for about eight hours that day. We normally get in the office between 5:30 a.m. and 6:30 a.m. and we'll go straight through to eight, eight or nine o'clock at night. Um, I tell the crew when we start and when we end, and it's their job to actually commit to coming in. I do not to ask you what time you'll be here, uh, that type of thing. If, if you want to learn and be involved actively in what we're doing then you'll find a way to get here, and you'll make, uh, you'll make time to show up and commit to the program. Uh, so I'm a big fan of communicating as far as what your, avail what your available learning opportunities are, uh, and then it's your job to create your own experience. We also do a huge um, – uh, uh, it's actually a binder. It's an intern binder that we keep in-house, and it's 100 percent top secret. The number one rule in our internship program is no one sees the binder. If someone sees the, sees the binder, opens up the binder, yourself included, if you come in and ask to see the binder, that intern experience for that individual will be done on that moment. Uh, it's one of those things that I just think you need to you need to build a little bit of loyalty, a little bit of trust. you got to find a way to connect with those people. In the military, they do it different ways, and, and uh, I kind of learned through that type of thing. you got to find a way to really uh, make it your own. And so that way, these individuals get a chance to create a, a template – uh, that we give to everybody and then actually turn it into their own, whether they're interested in sports psychology and the research that goes into that or uh, interviews such as this or editing or, uh, you know, you kind of get the gist for books and all these other things that we kind of expose them to through a structured approach uh, that includes case studies and DVDs and, and listening to podcasts, whether it's mine, yours or other people. Uh, you're, you're, if you structure the program correctly, there should never be downtime. One question I never get. 
what should I be doing right now? I never <laughs> right. did that. Uh, and it's not because – I, I, I grew up in an internship environment where if you asked that question, the answer was go clean the equipment. Right. How about this? I'll go clean the equipment because if I got everything else taken care of, that might be my only calm part of the day. <laughs> you know, so you'll see us often as a staff cleaning equipment or racking stuff up or if something comes in that's new and, and we want to try it out. We'll all be out there trying to play with it. It's not one of those things where I just delegate and run away. Uh, I just don't think you can – I think you have to lead from the front. Uh, I, I really do believe you got to be out there with your, with your warriors and make sure that they're being warriors and not warriors. Yeah, that, those are all great points, and one thing we always talk about, I, I see it all the time. I see interns who, who are done with their 400 hours, and, and they, they were just cleaning equipment. They were just filing paperwork, and they weren't actually coaching and, and starting the process of learning to be a coach. And one thing we do here is like the first week, it's like kind of fly on the wall, see, see a little bit of how our system of training unfolds. But by about week two, week three, you're in the mix. You know, you're running watches, you're running rest intervals, and then, you know, as we get closer to the end, you're actually running the actual sessions. Um, and so it's a, it's a nice evolution for them, but it gives them that practical experience that that's the number one thing when they're looking for a job. Well, what's your practical experience? And a lot of these kids honestly can't say that they have it in, in unless they're in an internship process like yours. So uh, hats off to you for getting those kids in there and getting them involved. I think some people just... Look at the internship processes is how can I utilize 400 hours or 600 hours of free help versus how can I truly prepare this person and give them the stamp of approval that they've gone through my internship process. And to me, that's the most important thing. Like if you're going to put it on your resume, you better be able to show it, talk it, and be it. I, I treat it uh, – I'll, I'll probably change your mindset here a little bit again. Uh, on day one, I actually sign off on all their paperwork saying that their their environment, uh, their excuse me, their internship is completed and they've gotten an A. On day one, I do that mm. because if the experience is about chasing a, a letter grade and not being concerned about learning from failures or learning from successes, then it's not really truly a learning environment. So we do a really good job of saying from day one, you've already got an A. Here's your paperwork. You've done four hours, 400 excuse me hours or whatever the time commitment is from their standpoint. If you don't want to come, do me a favor and don't show up because you're not here for that letter grade. What you're here for is that recommendation or the ability for you and I alike to make a phone call on your behalf. Yeah. That is what you do an internship for. For the young people that are doing intern or internship experiences or mentorship experiences, that type of thing, uh, one of the things that we start out very quickly and, and make sure that people realize is one easy way to connect with any program, whether it's me sending an intern to you or vice versa, is do you know how to stretch somebody? Do you know how to warm somebody up? And can you do some weak link exercises, rotator cuff, shins, uh, some of those things, again, different than the bench press because everyone's concerned about the clean, the bench press, the squat. And all of a sudden the conversation changes and they're like, oh, you do something a little different. But if you can be really skilled in maybe five or six different things that may be a little bit off the cuff from the general strength and conditioning personal training community, yes, you will naturally draw attention to yourself and people will be interested in hearing more about what you have to say. Absolutely right. I love it. Great. All great points. So let, let's take a step past the interns and let's talk about the facility that you're in currently. And you made mention uh, that you have some Olympians in there. So we're about uh, six months out of trials, depending on what sports you're looking at, and uh, uh, roughly seven months from the Olympics. Right. Uh, how's, how's the vibe and the feel in your facility? Everybody starting to get that, uh, that itch to compete? Yeah, you can see the, uh, the personalities are starting to change. And right. uh, it, it's neat to see... Uh, we get, we're, we're very lucky to have a lot of different people come in the facility, and, and I, don't, I don't like making lists because I don't think uh, the level of people that you work with defines who you are as a coach. Uh, but you can see where the seasons are starting for the pro levels or even the college sector or down to high school changes. We're doing this in, in uh, middle, middle of February interview kind of scenario, so we know we're going winter to, winter to spring scenario. Um, but the Olympians in particular – uh, now is when they start ramping up, man. We're under 140 days. Uh, we know that that is the, the situation. We're starting to talk about uh, that, that ability to be uh, to strive for perfection but accept excellence. Mm -hmm. uh, if you try to be perfect, you're never going to achieve it. You're always going to be frustrated. Uh, I really think you need to hold yourself accountable to a high level uh, but be, be understanding uh, to the fact that you need to put a brick on the wall every single day. You need to yeah. – uh, can you make each rep better? Can you make each stroke better? Can you – can you, uh, you know, eat cleaner? Can you hydrate more? Can you just get 15 more minutes of sleep? Can you remove stress? 
I mean, those are all messages that need to be established. Uh, I know with our swimming side of things, swimming as a whole, they don't get a lot of motivation from uh, – outside sources. If from a traditional quote-unquote land sport, uh, basketball, you make a free throw, people jump on top of you. At any point in volleyball, they're celebrating. Uh, baseball, you hit a home run, the crowd goes nuts. Swimming doesn't really have that. So um, we do a good job of trying to communicate or, or we've been trying to communicate even via email or text or some of our other social media means just to create an environment or a buzz that makes them think positive thoughts. I don't think mental toughness uh, comes from physical trauma. I mean, a lot of people say you got to run hard or you got to, you know, you got to suck that. it up. Uh, I don't know if that comes. I don't know if those two things go hand in hand. Uh, but I do believe mentally tough people can replace uh, negative thoughts with positive thoughts more quickly. Hmm. So as soon as you see your mind starting to shift, can you replace a positive thought in that that hole, that black hole that we don't want to go down? And when it gets tough on a leg press or a bench press or a sprint or whatever, uh, can you really sit there and suck it up and, and say, I can be a better person right now? I think that's how you build a good team, but I don't know if that's how you build great teammates. If you are willing to not only say that and, and fix that, that thought process in your head, but then once again c- encourage a teammate or teammates plural, uh, that's when you start building a team. And I really think that's a really unique gift uh, that good leaders have. Absolutely. Rob, with your swimmers, uh, what, what kind of exercises have you found that are your, just your go-tos that you just love? Obviously, everybody's an individual, but are there certain exercises? We can look at the dynamics of swimming in dry land versus in the water and how from a contractile standpoint, contractile velocity, there's some things that change. And so you have a lot of people argue you know, how much transfer is happening. What kind of things are you implementing with swimmers? Not too specific, but, yeah. but just throw some tidbits out there for our listeners. Yeah, we have uh, on our very first meeting for starting winter camp uh, here, we actually had a meeting and we talked about, uh, you know, the the program as a whole, as you're implying. And and Mm -hmm. we're fairly vague, but still specific enough to kind of get the the generalization. I don't think as coaches we should really uh, crush our athletes or coaches even for that matter, the sport coaches we work with, with unbelievable amounts of science or or quote unquote knowledge. I don't think that that necessarily proves you're better or worse than than the gift that you're given as far as the passion you share with others. Um, So we try to dummy it down. And one of the athletes uh, actually asked me, uh, you know, how, how sports specific is this going to be? And I wasn't trying to be a wise guy, but I said as sports specific as a, as a hip press can be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, ultimately, we're trying to bend at the knee and mimic that squat motion or work on your hamstrings or, or I'm just trying to get you genu- genuinely healthy so you can practice at a higher level. Yes. So that you can recover more quickly. Uh, so you can prepare your body for the competitions that will be in front of us. Yeah. I don't think you can do anything that is quote unquote uh, sports specific in the weight room. They don't push weights. Uh, so can it be as appropriate as possible? I think that's a, a conversation that I've had for many, many years. And again, we have certification bodies and, and uh, events that go around claiming that they're sports specific. And they have nothing to do with the practice or the game at, uh, or the competition uh, at hand. And I think it, we're, our field's kind of gotten a little morphed there, in my opinion, as far as um, what, what our real true purpose is. But it's, uh, one of the weak areas, I think, for uh, swimmers in particular – uh, we spend a lot of times training their legs, uh, their middle to low trap area, that, that bottom part of the shoulder blade, if you want to call it that, middle part of the back. Uh, I think that those two things are kind of stronger. I think they become healthier. Uh, then obviously we're going to do stuff to help with the rotator cuff, and I don't mean necessarily only external rotation. Uh, we will do other things as well. Uh, we don't shy away from even uh, overhead shoulder presses and stuff like that. Uh, it just depends on the individual. Again, you also work with baseball players. I work with baseball players. Some pitchers can throw 97 miles an hour and do 150-pound shoulder press, it, but they don't have any issues in their shoulder. Uh, other people can do a 15-pound front raise, and they can be down and out for three weeks. I mean, so you got to really assess the, the individual. And again, as you implied earlier, as far as the young people in our field, uh, you can sit there and, and, and uh, come up with these incredible program designs uh, when you're sitting there with the exercise physiology teacher or the, the program 101 person or whoever that is. Uh, but when you get out in the real world, uh, maybe you might want to ask a question and then listen to the response of the athlete. Yeah. A lot of times they will tell you uh, what will work for them most likely. Well, they, they know their history and they know, you know, what, what exercises aggravate them or what they can't do. And sometimes we just, you know, coaches, young coaches will throw blanket, you know, templates together and say, do this. And next thing you know, you've got that athlete down and out. And I completely agree with you 100% where I've always said with my swimmers, the goal is to make them 
them strong enough and stable enough to handle the rigors of practice so they can continue to swim consistently at the efforts that they need to. And, and, and to your point as well, I think we also have to understand um, what our role is. And that's probably the biggest thing that I've been really lecturing on lately is know your role and how you fit. The second you do that as a practitioner, your job becomes a lot easier because you can sit there and say, I'm going to make a more robust, a more athletic person and hand them off to their sport coach and say, have fun with this person. Right. Correct. Yeah, the, uh, I, 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 I get, we'll remove from swimming, but even like, a, like in a basketball section or a football team or that type of thing, uh, you're not a sport coach. Uh, but you can at practice, and, and again, for these young people, if you want to change up a little bit about your role or how you're perceived by the coaching staff, uh, you can always bring balls back to the offense or back to the drill. Uh, you don't have to sit there and, and lean on the on the water bucket and, and do nothing during practice. You can always count high fives. You can always have a bottle of water. Uh, you can eventually, as you start learning things, you can be a passer or a catcher. Uh, you can start at, at, you know, at developing yourself as far as how can you contribute to practice. And as you start doing that more and more, you'll start finding out that those sport coaches want to return the favor and they want to come into the weight room and they want to learn how to do the three-way row or how to spot the bench press or, or the lap pull down or the hip press or the squat. That's when you really start to develop as a team yeah. as opposed to just different entities that are trying to help the athlete be successful on game day. Agreed. I mean, that's a, a, such a great point. I mean, you need to go to the those practices as a coach one you need to just understand the temperament of the coach you need to really see biomechanically what's happening energetically uh, you know what type of rest intervals do they tend to follow which ones do they tend to miss and so that way as a practitioner you can ask yourself much better questions but to your point it shows that coach that head coach that position coach it shows them how invested you are into that athlete fantastic points I like that you use the word invested, and here's a here's a difference. You can be someone in this field who is interested in the field, and you can be mediocre to, to at best at, at some point. But the moment you become an interest, or excuse me, invested in the individuals you work with, you will instantly become exponentially more successful. Uh, uh, perfect. You're absolutely right. So, Rob, we're getting close to the end here, and I just want to be able to. I, I really. I always enjoy this part. You know, if you can, we all have mentors. Can you just kind of name off a few of your mentors that have helped you get to where you are today? Yeah, I, I've been very fortunate to have a lot. I've been, again, I've been doing this for, I guess it's over two decades now. So, I mean, that list could be going for on forever. But, uh, I mean, I, I started back uh, uh, with Dr. Brian Wilt. At the time, it was Brian Wilt, and he learned under Ken Manny. Okay. So that, that Michigan State kind of bloodline, um, I get a chance now to learn almost every day. I could call him any, at any moment. Uh, Mike Gittleson, who was at Michigan for 30 years. Uh, I actually most recently been able to connect with uh, probably the last two years or so, Al Vermeil. Uh, to Dor Bampa, I actually talk to fairly regularly. Uh, I'll say once every two or three months. I mean, he's an untouchable. I mean, I mean, most people don't even know his voice. So right. uh, that type of thing. Um, I had a chance to work with Tim Swanger, Marcus Sonovich. Uh, again, that that pipeline through Dan Riley and the Washington Redskins when they won four Super Bowls. Uh, that that. His lineage, as we want to call it. I walked with, not to him directly, but uh, down the line. Uh, I, I've been able to get a chance to go uh, to go visit and see people like Jason Gallucci at Penn State or, or John Thomas when he was at Penn State as well. Uh, Gallucci then went to Princeton. Uh, Jeff Watson when he was at Villanova. Uh, I mean, I, I can name drop for hours. Um, and, and then I also expanded from necessarily visiting strength coaches. Like, again, you implied what, what should young strength coaches be doing. I think you need to go watch and just, just go and experience what other people are doing. Again, uh, Lauren, if you're ever in the Baltimore area, my doors are completely open to you, your staff, uh, anyone you know. If you shoot me a text, I will completely show them anything they would like. Uh, we just had the coaches from um, uh, Baron Munchen, and I think it's a German football team. I'm sure I'm, sure I'm mangling that team, but it's the, uh, name, the, the, the name, I should say. Uh, but the number one German soccer team, we just had those uh, the coaches in the other day for three or four days just learning about what we do for system-wise. I mean, they didn't even know what manual shin was. Like, how do you address the anterior tibialis? Uh, and they have shin splint issues potentially with athletes. Uh, that was just fun just to teach them that. Um, 
But if you're a young coach, you got to go watch and learn. Uh, if you come to our environment, you'll see uh, our guys will have a pen in their back pocket and, and most likely a tablet or a, a paper folded up because we don't ask questions on the floor. But when we sit down in our staff meeting twice a day, two times a day, we have a staff meeting. And uh, normally, sometimes they're 15 minutes, sometimes they're 30, and sometimes we got to sit there and go over things longer. It doesn't make a difference to me if it helps the clients or the kids that we get a chance to work with. Uh, you'll see them taking notes. And I think notes are a big indicator of how much you really care about listening to others as opposed to putting your own questions out in front of it before you can hear the response of, of what other people have been doing. Uh, awesome, awesome. So, uh, Coach Taylor, tell us a little bit about where people can find you, either on social media or your actual website. Yeah, we're actually uh, trying to keep it on a download, but I'll tell you now, we're, we're actually redoing the website. So, smarterteamtraining.com. Uh, we actually had a meeting this morning with some web guys, so hopefully by – the mid part of this summer here, we got a we got a pretty crazy looking website coming. It's going to be pretty slick. Cool. Uh, but I am very active on social media and the stuff we share. And I don't mean uh, what I ate for breakfast. I mean I am constantly sharing uh, videos of what we're doing in house, pictures of what we're doing in house, uh, motivational topics. And I got away from trying to please others, so I actually share things that inspire me. Uh, I, I also use them for sometimes just for something else to talk about in a huddle. I mean, you and I go through time and time again at the at the end of the session or the end of practices. What do you say? How do you how do you teach leaders to become even better leaders, or to teach teammates to lead one another, or lead their schoolmates? Or uh, we work with men or, or adult ladies as well, and um, sometimes they need a little bit of pick me up. So I'll actually go to our Twitter feed or our Facebook feed and uh, go through that to find a way to inspire them. Twitter is at Smarter Team. At the time, Twitter didn't give us any more letters than that, so Smarter Team. Uh, Facebook is Facebook.com, uh, Smarter Team Training. Uh, we've now done – one of my goals last year was to spend uh, – or to get up uh, a 1,000 pictures of us training in-house uh, on Instagram. And we have – I think we got to 15 or 1,600 uh, images last year. And if you go on there, they are 100% in-house pictures. Uh, Instagram is at Smarter Team Training, and uh, we are very, very active on all of those uh, media formats. As you imply, the radio show has been an awesome uh, opportunity, and if somebody wants to start one of those, uh, I would be glad to kind of point you in the direction of where you can find uh, information to do that. I think it's a great opportunity. I think, uh, again, I commend you and uh, for doing a show like this. And, uh, for the listeners, the way you actually help Lauren here uh, expand his show and his reach and help encourage others to do this is wherever the platform is, whether it's on iTunes, iHeartRadio, uh, YouTube, Sprecher, I don't care where it is. If you can rate and then leave a review and write a review, it takes you three seconds. If you can do that, the time that Coach and I just spent with you on, on this episode uh, is well worth it to me because we need to start sharing more information about what has worked for others and then really try to expand and elevate this field. Oh, absolutely. Couldn't agree more with you again. Uh, so many darn good points in this interview, and uh, I think that's a, a great one to end with right there. I mean, at the same time, you know, you've got to uh, make sure that we're reaching the individuals and they're they're really taking away the information that's relevant to them, and the only way we know is through feedback. So, uh, Rob, I just want to thank you for your time. I know you have a very busy schedule. You have the NFL Combine coming up. You have the Olympics coming up. Uh, so thank you for spending the time with us today, and uh, look forward to uh, – watching you on all the social media and everything that you guys have cooking out there in Baltimore. Thank you very much, Coach, man. Make sure you're inspiring greatness to someone new each day. Boom. Love it.